The Prison, a vision by Rick Joyner. Suddenly, I was standing in a large prison yard. There were huge walls, such as I had never seen before. They extended for as far as I could see, hundreds of feet high and very thick. There were other fences and razor wire in front of the wall. Every few hundred feet, there were guard towers along the top of the wall, and I could see guards in each one, but they were too far away for me to see much about them. It was very gray, dark, and dreary, which seemed to perfectly reflect the mass of people who stood in the prison yard. All over the yard, people sat in groups of their own kind. Old black men were in one group, young black men in another. Old and young white men also stayed apart, and the women were also separated. With each race, this seemed to be the same. Those with any distinguishing characteristic were separated, except for the youngest children. Between the groups, many people seemed to be milling about. As I watched, I could tell that they were trying to find their own identity by finding the group which they were most like. However, it was obvious that these groups did not let anyone join them easily. As I looked more closely at these people, I could see that they all had deep wounds and many scars from previous wounds. Except for the children, they all seemed to be nearly blind and could only see well enough to stay in their own group. Even within their groups, they were constantly trying to see the differences that others might have. When they found even the smallest difference, they would attack the one who was different. They all seemed hungry, thirsty, and sick. I approached an older man and asked him why they were all in prison. He looked at me in astonishment declaring emphatically that they were not in prison. And why should I ask such a stupid thing? I pointed out the fences and the guards, and he replied, What fences? What guards? He looked at me as if I had insulted him terribly, and I knew that if I asked him anything else, I would be attacked. I asked a young woman the same question and received the same response. I then realized that they were so blind that they could not even see the fences or the guards. These people did not know that they were in prison. I decided to ask a guard why these people were in prison. As I walked toward the fences, I could see holes in them. They could be easily climbed through. When I reached the wall itself, I found it so irregularly built that it was easy for me to climb. Anyone could easily escape, but no one was trying because they did not know that they were captives. When I got to the top of the wall, I could see for a great distance and saw the sun shining beyond the walls. It did not shine in the prison yard because of the height of the walls and the clouds that hung over it. I saw fires far off in the prison yard toward the end where the children were gathered. The smoke from these fires formed a thick cloud over the yard that turned what would have just been the shade from the walls into a choking, dreary haze. I wondered what was burning. I walked along the top of the wall until I reached the guard post. I was surprised to find a guard dressed in a fine suit with a collar indicating that he was some kind of minister or priest. He was sh not shocked to see me, and I think he assumed that I was another guard. Sir, why are these people in prison? I asked. The question shocked him, and I watched fear and suspicion come over him like a blanket. What prison? He replied. What are you talking about? I'm talking about those people in the prison yard. I said, feeling a strange boldness. You're obviously a prison guard because you're in the guardhouse. But why are you dressed like that? I continued. I'm not a prison guard. I'm a minister of the gospel. 
I am not their guard. I am their spiritual leader. And this is not a guard house. This is the Lord's house. Son, if you think your questions are funny, I'm not laughing. He grabbed his gun and seemed ready to shoot me. Uh, please excuse me for disturbing you, I replied, sensing that he would definitely use his gun. As I walked away, I expected to hear shots at any moment. The man was so insecure, I knew he would shoot before thinking if he felt threatened. I could also tell that he was sincere. He really did not know that he was a guard. I walked along the wall until I felt I was a safe distance away and turned back to look at the minister. He was pacing back and forth in his guardhouse, greatly agitated. I wondered why my questions disturbed him so much. I, it was obvious that my questions did not open him to see anything differently, but rather made him even more insecure and more deadly. As I walked, I felt the desperation to find out what was going on and I thought about how I could rephrase my question so as not to offend the next guard I tried to talk to. As I approached the next guardhouse, I was again surprised by the appearance of the guard. It was not another minister, but a young lady who was about 25 years old. Uh, miss, uh, may I ask you some questions? I inquired. Certainly. What can I help you with? She said with a condescending flair, Are you one of the parents of these children? Uh, no, I responded. I, I'm a writer, which I somehow knew was the answer I should give her. As I expected, this question got her attention. Not wanting to make the same mistake I had made with the minister by calling what he was standing in a guardhouse, I asked the young lady, why she was standing in that place. Her response was immediate, and she seemed surprised that I didn't know. Well, I'm a school teacher, so don't you think it quite natural that I should be in my school? So this, this is your school, I replied, indicating the guardhouse. Oh, yes. I've been here for three years now. I may be here for the rest of my life. I love what I do so much. This last remark was so mechanical that I thought I would discover something if I pressed her. What do you teach? It must be interesting for you to consider spending the rest of your life doing it. I teach general science and social studies. It is my job to shape the philosophy and worldview of these young minds. What I teach them will steer them for the rest of their lives. But what do you write? She inquired. Of uh, books, I responded. I write leadership books, anticipating her next question. I also somehow knew that if I said Christian leadership books, our conversation would have ended. She seemed even more interested after this answer. Leadership is an important subject, she stated, still with a slightly condescending air. Changes are happening so quickly that we must have the right leadership tools to steer the changes in the right direction. Uh, what direction is that? I asked. Toward the prosperity that can only come through peace and security, she replied, as if she were surprised that I would even ask such a question. Well, uh, I, don't, I don't mean to offend you, I replied, but I'm interested in your views on this. What do you feel is the best way for this peace and security to be achieved? Well, through education, of course. We are together on this spaceship Earth, and we have to get along. Through education, we are helping deliver the masses from their caveman tribal mentality to understand that we are all the same and that if we all do our part for society, we will all prosper together. Well, that's interesting, I replied, but we are not all the same. It is also interesting that all the people down there are becoming even more divided and separated than ever. Do you think it may be time to possibly modify your philosophy a bit? She looked at me in both amazement and agitation. 
but obviously not because she even considered for a moment that what I said was true. Sir, are you completely blind? She finally responded. No, I, I believe I see quite well, I answered. I have just come from walking among the people and have never seen such division and animosity between different groups of people. It seems to me that the conflict between them is worse than ever. I could tell that my statements were like slaps in the face to this lady. It was as if she could just not believe that someone was even saying these things, much less believing that there was a chance that there might be some truth in them. As I watched her, I could tell that she was so blind she could barely see me. She was in such a high tower that there was no way for her to see the people below. She really did not know what was going on, but sincerely thought she could see everything. Well, we are changing the world, she said with obvious disdain. We are changing people. If there are still people acting like beasts, such as you described, we will change them too. We will prevail. Mankind will prevail. That's quite a responsibility for someone so young, I remarked. She bristled even more at that statement, but before she could respond, two women appeared walking toward the door of the guardhouse along the top of the wall. One was a black woman who appeared to be in her fifties, and the other was a well-dressed white woman who was probably in her early thirties. They talked with each other as they walked, and both appeared confident and dignified. I could tell that they could see, which is obviously how they reached the top of the wall. To my surprise, the young school teacher grabbed her gun and stepped outside of the guardhouse to meet them, obviously not wanting these women to get any closer. She greeted them with a very superficial cheerfulness and an obvious air of superiority that she seemed to want to impress on them. To my surprise, the two women became timid and overly respectful to the one who was so much younger. We've come to ask you about something our children are being taught that we don't understand, the black woman stated, mustering some courage. Oh, I'm sure that a lot is now taught that you don't understand, the teacher replied condescendingly. The woman kept looking at the teacher's gun, which she handled in such a way so that they would constantly be aware of it. I was standing close by, amazed by the whole scene. The teacher turned and looked at me nervously. I could tell that she was afraid I might say something to the woman. As she fingered the gun, she demanded that I leave. The women looked up to see who she was talking with, and I realized that they could not see the fear had blinded them. I called out to the women, entreating them to have courage and believe what they felt in their heart. They looked in my direction as if they could only hear a noise. They were losing their ability to hear as well. Seeing this, the young teacher smiled. She then aimed her gun at me and blew a whistle. I felt as if she perceived me to be the most dangerous person alive. I knew that I could not wait around for whoever she called with her whistle. I also realized that if I just stepped back a little, I would be safe because the young teacher was so blind. I was right. I walked away with her screaming, blowing the whistle, and finally becoming so enraged that she began to shoot at the two women. As I stood on top of the wall between the two guard posts, wondering about all this, I felt the presence of wisdom. You must return to the prison yard. I will be with you. Know that you have the vision to escape any trap or weapon. Only remember that fear can blind you. As you walk in the faith that I am with you, you will always see the way to go. You must also be careful to only reveal your vision to those whom I lead you. Vision is what the guards fear the most. I know you want to ask me a lot of questions, but they will be better answered by the experiences you will have there. I climbed down and began to walk through the yard. As I passed by the prisoners, they seem almost completely disinterested in me or all the commotion on the wall. 
I then remembered that they could not see that far. A young black man stepped into my path and looked at me with bright, inquisitive eyes. Who are you? We both said at the same time. As we stood looking at each other, he finally said, My name is Stephen. I can see. What else do you want to know about me that you don't already know? How could I know anything else about you? I inquired. The one who helped me to see said that one day others would come who were not prisoners. They would also be able to see, and they would tell us who we are and how to escape from this prison. I started to protest that I did not know who he was when I remembered that wisdom had told me about those whom I would meet when I passed through the next door. I do know you, and I know some things about you, I acknowledged. But I confess that this is the weirdest prison I had ever seen. But this is the only prison, he protested. Well, how do you know that if you've been here all your life? I asked. The one who helped me to see told me that this was the only one. He said that every soul who had ever been in prison was held captive here. He always told me the truth, so I believe this. Who is the one who helped you to see? I asked not only wanting to know who had helped him to see, but also interested in how this was the prison that held every soul captive. He never told me his real name, but he called himself Wisdom. Wisdom? What did he look like? I questioned. He was a young black athlete. He could see better than anyone and seemed to know everyone here. It is strange though, I have met others here who said they have also met wisdom, but they all described him differently. Some said that he was white, and others said that he was a woman. Unless there are many wisdoms, he is a master of disguise. Can you take me to him? I asked. I would, but I have not seen him for a long time. I am afraid that he has left, or, or maybe even died. I have become very discouraged since he departed. My vision even started getting worse until I saw you. As soon as I saw you, I knew everything he told me was true. He said that you knew him, too, so why are you asking me so much about him? I do know him, and be encouraged, your friend is not dead. I will tell you his real name, but first I must ask you a few questions. Well, I know that you can be trusted, and I know that you and others like you who are coming will want to meet everyone who can see, and I can take you to some of them. I also know that you and the others are coming to help a lot of these other prisoners to see. But I'm surprised by one thing, though. What's that? You're white! I never thought that the ones who came to help us see and, and be set free would be white. I'm sure that there are many others coming who are not white, I responded. I can tell that you already have considerable vision so I know you can understand what I am about to tell you. As I looked at Stefan to be sure he was listening, I was moved by how open and teachable he was, in striking contrast to the teacher who had been about his same age. This man will be a true teacher, I thought, as I continued. When we get to the place of ultimate vision, we will not judge people by the color of their skin, gender, or age. We will not judge others by appearances, but after the spirit. Well, that sounds like what our teacher used to tell us, Stefan responded a little surprised. There is a difference, though, I continued. They tried to make you think that we are all alike, but we were all created different for a reason. True peace will only come when we respect the distinctions we have. When we really know who we are, we will never be threatened by those who are different when we are free, we are free to show those who are different from us honor and respect, always seeking to learn from one another, just as you are now doing with me. I understand, Stephen replied. I hope I didn't offend you by saying I was surprised that you were white. No, I was not offended. I understand. I am encouraged that you were able to recognize me in spite of the color of my skin. But remember, every time we open our hearts to learn from those who are different, our vision will increase. Your eyes are already brighter than when we first met. 
I was just thinking about how quickly my vision is being restored, Stefan remarked. I now know why I am here, I added. You must keep in mind that your vision is the most valuable possession. Every day you must do that which will help increase your vision. Stay away from the people and things that will make you lose your vision. Yes, like getting discouraged. Exactly. Discouragement is usually the beginning of the loss of vision, I said. To accomplish our purpose, we must resist discouragement in any form. Discouragement blinds. When I began to see, I started to feel that I had a purpose, maybe even an important one, Stephen continued. Can you help me know what my purpose is? Yes, I think I can. To know our purpose is one of the greatest ways that our vision grows. It is also one of the greatest defenses against things like discouragement, which destroys vision. I think my main purpose here is to help you and the others whose vision is being restored to know their purpose. But first, we need to talk about something even more important. When Stefan spoke, I could hear the voice of wisdom, so I knew that this young man had been taught by the Lord. I also know that he did not know the Lord's name and would have difficulty believing that wisdom's name was Jesus. I knew that I would need wisdom just to share the name of wisdom. I thought about the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers that wisdom said I would meet when I went through that door. I never dreamed that I would meet them in a place like this. As I looked out over the great mass of people, I felt his presence. He was with me, and even in the gloom of this terrible prison, excitement was welling up in me. This is what I've been prepared for, I thought. Stefan, what do you see when you look at this great mass of people? I asked. I see confusion, despair, uh, bitterness, hatred. I see darkness, he replied. Uh, that is certainly true. But look again with the eyes of your heart. Use your vision, I responded. He looked for a long time and then said with some hesitation, I now see a great field with buried treasure in it. The treasure is everywhere and in almost every form. That is right, I responded. That is also a revelation of your purpose. You are a treasure hunter. Some of the greatest souls who ever lived are trapped here, and you will help find them and set them free. But how will I find them and how will I set them free when I am not even free? You already know how to find them, but it is true that you will not be able to set them free until you are free. That is your next lesson. You must also remember that you will always know your purpose in a situation by seeing with the eyes of your heart. What you see from your inmost being will always reveal your purpose. Is that how you knew I was to be a treasure hunter? Yes, but you must be free before you can become who you are created to be. Why haven't you escaped through those holes in the fence? I asked. When I first began to see, I saw the fence and the wall. I also saw holes in the fence and had gone through them. When I got to the wall, I tried several times to climb it, but fear would overcome me because I'm afraid of heights. I also thought that if I got over the wall, I'd be shot. Uh, those guards can't see nearly as well as you think, I replied. They are almost as blind as the people here. This seemed to really surprise Stefan, but I could also tell that it opened his eyes even more. Can you see to the top of the wall? I asked. Yes, I can see it from here. I want you to remember this, I continued. I have now been in many places. Call them different worlds or, or realms, if you will. There is one important principle that I have found to be true in almost every place, and you must remember it for the rest of your life. What is it? You can always go as far as you can see. If you can see the top of the wall, you can get there. When you get to the top of the wall, you'll be able to see, and able to see farther than you ever have seen before. 
You must keep going for as far as you can see. Never stop as long as you can still see farther. I understand, he replied. But I'm still afraid to climb the wall. It's so high. Is it safe? I will not lie to you and tell you that it is safe. But I know that it is much more dangerous not to climb it. If you do not use your vision by walking in what you see, you will lose it. And then you will perish here. How will I seek out the treasure that is here if, if I leave? That is a good question, but is also one which keeps many from fulfilling their purpose. I can only tell you now that you have a great journey you must complete first. At the end of your journey, you will find a door leading you back to this prison, just as I have found. When you return, your vision will be so great that they will never be able to trap you here again. Your vision will also be great enough to see the treasure that is here. Stefan turned and looked again at the wall. I still feel great fear, he lamented. I don't know if I can do it. You have vision, but you lack faith. Vision and faith must work together, I said. There is a reason why your faith is weak. Please tell me, what is it? Is there something that will help my faith to grow as my vision increases? Yes. Faith comes from knowing who wisdom really is. You must know his true name. Just knowing his name will give you enough faith to get over that wall to freedom. The better you get to know his name, the greater the obstacles and barriers you will be able to overcome on your journey. One day you will know his name well enough to move any mountain. What is his name? Stephen almost begged. His name is Jesus. Stephen looked at the ground and then up in the air as disbelief seemed to come over him. I watched as the struggle went on between his heart and his mind. Finally he looked at me again, and to my great relief he still had hope in his eyes. I knew that he had listened to his heart. I suspected it, he said. In fact, the whole time you were talking, I somehow knew that you were going to say that. I also know that you are telling me the truth. But I have some questions. Can I ask them? Of course. I have known many people who use the name of Jesus, but they are not free. In fact, they are some of the most bound people that I know here. Why? That is a good question, and I can only tell you what I have learned on my journey. I think that every case is different, but there are many who know his name, but do not know him. Instead of drawing closer to him and being changed by seeing him as he is, they try to make him into their image. Knowing the name of Jesus is much more than knowing just how to spell it or say it. It is knowing who he really is. This is where true faith comes from. I could still see doubt in Stefan's eyes, but it was the good kind of doubt, the kind that wants to believe rather than the kind that wants to disbelieve. I continued, there are others who really love Jesus and start to sincerely get to know him, but they also remain prisoners. These are the ones who let the wounds and mistakes suffered on the journey turn them back. These have tasted freedom, but they return to the prison because of the disappointments and failures. You can easily recognize them because they are always talking about the past instead of the future. If they were still walking by their vision, they would not always be looking backward. I have met many of those, Stefan remarked. You need to understand something if you are ever going to have this question answered. If you are to fulfill your destiny, you cannot be overly discouraged or encouraged by others who use the name of Jesus. We are not called to place our faith in His people, but in Him. Even the greatest souls will disappoint us at times because they are still human. Many who are like those I just described can also become great souls. Vision and faith can be restored even than those who have become the most discouraged and disappointed. As a treasure hunter, this is your job. We cannot discard any human being. 
they're all treasures to him. However, to really know him and walk in true faith, you must not judge him by his people, even the best or the worst, I shared. I always thought of Jesus as the white man's God. He never seemed to do much for our people. He is not a white man's God. He was not even white himself, but neither is he a black man's God. He created all, and he is the Lord of all. When you start to see him as the God of any one group, you have greatly reduced who he is, and you have greatly reduced your own vision. I watched silently as Stefan wrestled with many other things in his heart. I continued to feel the presence of wisdom, and I knew that he could explain all things better than I could. Finally, Stefan looked up at me, with light shining brighter than ever in his eyes. I know that all the questions that I have been wrestling with really do not have anything to do with who Jesus really is, but who people say he is. I know that what you're saying is true. I know that Jesus is the one who gave me vision, and he is wisdom. I must find out for myself who he really is. I must seek him. I must serve him. I also know that he has sent you here to help me get started. What, what, what do I do? Wisdom is here now, I began. You heard him when I spoke, just as I heard him speaking through you. You already know his voice. He is your teacher. He will speak to you through many different people, sometimes even through those who do not know him. Be quick to hear and obey what he says. Faith and obedience are the same. You do not have true faith if you do not obey. And if you have true faith, you will always obey. You said that you will serve him. That means that you will no longer live for yourself, but for him. In the presence of wisdom, you know the difference between what is right and what is wrong. When you come to know wisdom, you will also understand what is evil. You must renounce the evil that you have done in the past, as well as that which comes to you to tempt you in the future. You cannot live as others do. You are called to be a soldier of the cross. When you embrace his name and the truth of who he is, when that great light came into your eyes, when the peace and satisfaction began to flood your soul just a few moments ago, you were born again and began a new life. Wisdom has began speaking to you for some time, guiding you and teaching you, but now he lives in you. He will never leave you again, but he is not your servant, you are his. I, I do feel him, Stephen acknowledged, but how I love to see him again. You can see him with the eyes of your heart at any time. This is also your call, to see him more clearly and to follow him more closely. This is what the journey is for. On your journey, you will learn about his name and the power of the cross. When you have been trained, you will return here in that power and you will help set many of these captives free. Will you still be here? I don't know. Sometimes I will have to work to do here, and sometimes I will have work to do helping others on their journeys. I might meet you again out there where you are going. I am still on my own journey. This is part of it. On your journey, there will be many doors that you must go through. You will never know where they lead. Some may lead you back here. Some doors may take you into the wilderness, which all must travel through. Some lead to glorious heavenly experiences, and it is tempting to always look for those doors. But they are not always the ones we need to help us fulfill our destiny. Do not choose doors by their appearance, but always ask wisdom to help you. Stefan returned his gaze upon the wall. I watched a smile appear. 
I can climb that wall now, he said. I even look forward to the challenge. I must admit that I still have fear, but it does not matter. I know that I can climb it, and I cannot wait to see what is behind it. I know that I am free. I am no longer a prisoner. I walked with Stefan to the first fence. He was surprised to discover that there was not only holes in it, but that wherever he touched them, the fence would fall apart in his hand, making other holes. What are these fences made of? He asked. Delusions, I explained. Every time someone escapes through them, a hole is made for others to go through. You can go through the holes that are already here or make ones yourself. Stefan chose a place that was thick with barbed wire, stretched out his arms and walked straight through it, opening a large hole as he went. I knew that he would one day return here and lead many others out of the hole that he was now making. Watching him was sheer joy. I felt the presence of wisdom so strongly that I knew I would see him if I turned around. I did, and I was right. The great joy I was experiencing could be seen on his face as well. As I stood next to Wisdom, watching Stefan walk through the fences, he called out, What is the wall made of? Fear. I watched Stefan stop and look at the wall. It was huge. Many never got past the fences and I knew that this was a crucial test for Stefan. Without looking back, he called out again, Will you help me climb it? I can't help you, I responded. If I try to help you, it will only take you twice as long and be even harder. To conquer your fears, you must face them alone. The more I look up at it, the worse it seems, I heard him say. Stefan! You've made the first mistake. What did I do? He cried out dejectedly, already full of fear. You stopped. What do I do now? I feel like my feet are too heavy to move. Look at the hole you made in the fences, I said. Now look at the top of the wall and start walking. When you get to the wall, keep going. Do not stop to rest. There is no rest to be found by hanging on the side of the wall. So just keep climbing until you get to the top. To my great relief, he started moving forward again. He was going much slower, but he was moving. When he got to the wall, he began to climb, slowly but steadily. When I knew he was going to make it, I went to the wall and quickly climbed it so I could meet him on the other side. I knew Stefan would be thirsty, so I waited for him by a stream. When he got there, he was a little surprised to see me, but very glad. I was just as surprised to see the change in him. Not only were his eyes shining more brightly and clearly than ever, but he walked with a confidence and nobility that was stunning. I had seen him as a soldier of the cross, but I had not seen him as the great prince who he was obviously called to be. Tell me about it, I said. It was so hard to start walking again, and then to keep walking. I knew that if I ever stopped, it might be too hard to ever start again. I thought about the ones you told me of, the ones who knew the name of the Lord, but had never climbed the wall to walk in faith in his name. I knew that I could become one of them. And I decided that even if I fell, even if I died, I would rather die than stay in that prison. I'd rather die than not see what is on the other side and not make the journey that I'm called to make. It was hard, even harder than I thought, but it is already worth it. Here. Drink from this stream. You will find all of the water and food that you need for the journey. It will always be there when you really need it. 
Let the hunger and thirst keep you moving. When you find the refreshments, rest for as long as they last, and then keep going. He drank quickly and then stood up, anxious to move on. I will not see you again for a time, so there are a few things that I must tell you now that will help you on your journey. Stefan looked at me with a focus and brightness that was marvelous. Those who have known the greatest bondage will love liberty the most, I thought. I directed him to look at the highest mountain that he could see. You must now climb that mountain. When you get to the top, look for as far as you can see. Mark well what you see and look for the path that will lead you to where you are going. Make a map of the way in your mind. That is where you are called to go. I understand, he replied. But can it be seen from one of those lower mountains? I'm no longer afraid of climbing, but I'm anxious to get on with the journey. You can see places from those lower mountains and get to those places much faster. You could choose to do that. It will take you longer and be more difficult to climb that high mountain. But from there, you'll be able to see much farther and see something much greater. The journey from the high mountains will always be more difficult and take longer. You are free and you can choose either journey. You always take the highest mountain, don't you? Stefan asked. I know that is always the best, but I cannot say that I've always chosen the highest mountain. I have often chosen the easiest, quickest way, and I was always sorry when I did. I now realize that it was wisdom to always choose the highest mountain to climb. I know that the greatest treasure is always at the end of the longest, most difficult journey. I think that you, too, are that kind of treasure hunter. You have overcome great fear. Now is the time to walk in great faith. I know that what you're saying is true, and I know that in my heart I must climb the highest mountain now, or I will always choose that which is less than I could have. I am just anxious to get going and arrive at my destination. Faith and patience go together, I responded. Impatience is really a lack of faith. Impatience will never lead you to the highest purposes of God. Good can be the greatest enemy of best. Now is the time to establish a pattern in your life of always choosing the highest and best. This is the way to remain close to wisdom. What else are you supposed to tell me before I go? Stefan asked, sitting on a rock, wisely choosing to be patient and receive all that he needed to know before he left. I thought that he might already know wisdom better than I knew him. There is another wisdom that is not the wisdom of God. And there is another one who calls himself wisdom. He is not wisdom. He is our enemy. He can be difficult to recognize because he tries to appear as wisdom. And he is very good at it. He comes as an angel of light and he usually brings truth. He will have a form of truth, and he has, has wisdom, but it has taken me a long time to be able to distinguish them from the truth and the wisdom. I have learned that I can still be fooled by him if for one moment I think that I can't be. Wisdom has told me that we can never outsmart the enemy. Our defense is to learn to first recognize him and then resist him. Stefan's eyes became really wide as he started to understand. I know who you're talking about, he interjected. I met a lot of people in the prison who followed that one. They were always talking about a higher wisdom, a, a higher knowledge. They always seemed like noble, fair people but they felt foul. 
Whenever I told them about wisdom, they said that they knew wisdom too, and that he was their inner guide. However, when I listened to them, I did not feel that I was being led to freedom like they said, but rather to an even stronger bondage in that prison. I just felt darkness around them, not like the light I felt when I walked with wisdom. I knew that they were not the same. The true wisdom is Jesus. You now know that. True wisdom is to seek Him. Any wisdom that does not lead you to Jesus is false wisdom. Jesus will always set you free. The false wisdom will always lead you to bondage. However, true freedom often looks like bondage at first. And bondage usually looks like freedom at first. It's not going to be easy, is it? Stefano lamented. No, it's not going to be easy. It's not supposed to. Suspicion is not the same as true discernment. But if you are going to suspect anything, suspect what seems easy. I have never yet found easy through any door or any path that has been the right one. Taking the easy way must be the surest way to be misled. You have been called as a soldier, and you're going to have to fight. Right now, the whole world is in the power of the false wisdom, and you'll have to overcome the world to fulfill your destiny. Already, I've had to do things that were much harder than anything that I've ever done before, Stefan reflected. But you're right. It is hard, but it's worth it. I have never known such joy, such satisfaction, or such hope. Freedom is hard. It is hard to have to choose which mountain I climb. Back there, I knew that I could have chosen not to climb the wall. I felt like fear of making that choice was the wall inside of me. But once I made the choice, I knew that I would make it over the top. But does it become any easier? I don't think so. But somehow, hard gets even more fulfilling. There can be no victory without a battle. And the greater the battle, the greater the victory. The more victories you experience, the more you start to look forward to the battles. And you will rise even higher to face the bigger ones. What makes it easy is that the Lord is always leading us to victory. If you stay close to Him, you will never fail. After every battle, every test, you are much closer to Him and know Him much better. Will I always feel the darkness when the false wisdom tries to mislead me? Uh, I don't know. I do know that the darkness comes when He deceives us into self-seeking. When He deceived the first man and woman into eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the first thing that they did was to look at themselves. Once the false wisdom can make us self-centered, our fall into bondage is sure. The deceiver always tries you to get to seek yourself. The call to fulfill our destiny is not for our sake, but for the Lord's sake and for the sake of His people. Has anyone made it to their destiny without being tricked? I don't think so. Even the great Apostle Paul admitted to having been foiled by Satan. Peter was tricked a few times that were recorded in Scripture, and we don't know how many other times that were not recorded. But don't be overly concerned about being deceived. That is actually one of the biggest traps. He sidetracks many by having them fear more in his power to deceive than to have faith in the power of the Holy Spirit to lead them into all truth. Those who have fallen into this trap not only fall into increasing bondage to fear, but they will attack anyone who walks in the freedom that comes with faith. I am quite sure that you will not make it far up that mountain before they ambush you. And they know the name of Jesus? Stefan asked, a little confused. They must have known his name to get over that wall and have gone that far. I mean, didn't they know his name once? 
I'm sure they did. But stand and look throughout the valley ahead around every mountain. What do you see? It looks like little prisons. It looks like there are many just like the one that I came out of. That's why I was surprised when you told me that Wisdom had said there was only one prison. But after I was there for just a little while, I understood what he meant. Look at the high walls. Look at the fences. They're all the same. If you are captured along the way, they will not bring you back here. They know that you would choose death over that. But they will take you to one of those other prisons. When you get close to them, it is hard to see that they are prisons from the outside. But inside, they're all the same, with people divided and imprisoned by their fears. I'm glad you showed this to me, Stefan offered. I didn't even see the prisons when I was looking this way from the top of the wall, or when I was looking for the mountain I am to climb. And you think that I'll be ambushed many times by those who will try to capture me and put me into one of them? And these people will be using the name of Jesus? The Lord himself warns in scripture that in the last days many will come in his name, claiming that he is indeed the Christ, and yet they will deceive many. Believe me, there are many like that, and I do not believe that most of them know they are deceivers. I can tell you a characteristic that I have seen in all those that I have met. They quit while they're on their journey, stopping short of their destiny. It takes faith to keep going, and they choose to follow fear rather than faith. They begin to think that fear is faith and actually see the walls of fear around their prisons as strongholds of truth. Fear will do that to your vision. You can start to see strongholds that way. Few of these people are really dishonest. They are sincere, but they are deceived by one of the most powerful deceptions of all. The fear of deception. Should I fight them? I understand your question and have asked it many times myself. They destroy the faith of so many and do far more damage to the sojourners than all the cults and sects combined. There will be a time when all such stumbling blocks will be removed. But for now, they, too, are serving a purpose by making the way harder. Wisdom wants it to be harder? It is already so difficult just battling our own fears. Why does he want to make it harder by making us battle all those fearful people as well? The journey will be exactly as easy or hard as he wants it to be. This life is a temporary journey used to prepare those who will reign with him over the age to come, as sons and daughters of the Most High forever. Every trial is for the purpose of changing us into his image. One of the first things we must learn on this journey is not to waste a single trial but seize them as the opportunities that they are. If your path is more difficult, it is because of your high calling. Many are called, but few are chosen. Many will come to the wedding feast, but few will be the bride. We turned around to see wisdom standing behind us. He appeared as the young athlete that Stefan had come to know. Run the race that is set before you, and the prize will be greater than you can understand at this time. You know the discipline that it takes to prepare for the race. Now discipline yourself for righteousness. I have called all to run, but few run as to win. Discipline yourself to win. Then he was gone. Why did he leave? Stefan asked. He said all that is needed to be said at this time. He spoke to you of discipline. I would take that to be a most important word for you at this time. Discipline. I used to hate that word. He spoke to you about a race. Uh, were you a runner? Yes, I am very fast. I was always the fastest one in my school. 
and was even offered a scholarship to run for a major university. I take it that you did not accept it? No, I, I didn't. Was it because of a lack of discipline that you did not go to college? No, it was... Uh... There was a long silence as Stefan looked down at his feet. Yes, I, I think it probably was. Okay, don't worry about that now. However, you must understand something. Most who are potentially the best in every field or occupation never even become high achievers for the lack of that one thing, discipline. What you are doing now is much more important than track or college. Obviously, discipline has been a weakness of yours, and it has cost you much already. But in Christ, all things become new. In Him, the very things that have been your greatest weaknesses can become your greatest strengths. You are now His disciple. That means you are a discipled one. I know that you're telling me the truth, and I know that this is one race I do not want to lose. Do you see the path leading up the mountain? Yes. Its name is Discipline. Stay on it if you want to reach the top. The End